Miracles, part seven. I'm sorry. <clears throat> We've been discussing miracles uh, by Eric Metaxas, what they are, how, why they happen, and how they can change your life. And um, we have gotten into actual miracle stories, and we're now finishing up miracles of conversion um, and moving on to miracles of uh, health. Of healing. The uh, last uh, miracle of conversion is, is entitled A Brooklyn Drug Dealer Finds God. Again, I'm not giving you the whole thing. If you want that, read the book. Uh, but we're going to be discussing the most significant parts of it, at least in my opinion. Cisco, short for Francisco Angolero, was born in Puerto Rico in 1944. His family came from Brooklyn in 1949, and they were the first Puerto Ricans to live on Coney Island, which at that time was predominantly Irish, Italian, German, and Jewish. As a little boy in this very tough part of Brooklyn, Cisco's dark skin and inability to speak English made him a target for the other kids. In 1953, on his ninth birthday, Cisco's father gave him a baseball glove, which was promptly stolen by two neighborhood bullies. 16 and 17 years old, respectively. When Cisco's father found out, he seemed to have finally had enough. This had been going on for a while. And he gave his son permission to defend himself. Actually, he went much beyond that. Knowing Cisco to be far outmatched by these older kids, his father handed Cisco a baseball bat, sent him out the door, and made it clear that he'd better come back with his glove or else. As an added impetus, he said that if Cisco didn't return with the glove, he would take the bat in, he would turn the bat into splinters over Cisco's back. Cisco doesn't believe his father ever intended to carry through with that threat. He felt that it was one final encouragement to do what he needed to do to stand up to these older boys. So Cisco promptly went to the homes of each of these bullies, lured them outside, and unleashed the rage that had been building inside of him for years smashing each of them across the knees with the bat in brutal fashion, especially given his age. Needless to say, he brought the glove back, and after word got out that he would defend himself, he was given a wide berth. This is, uh, I guess you could say, one tough neighborhood. Over the next few years, Cisco's reputation as someone to be feared only grew. At age 11, he and a friend named Cookie began lifting weights. Unsurprisingly, the hulking young man, this, uh, after he'd been doing it for a while, was hired as a bouncer at various Brooklyn clubs and was later hired to be a bodyguard to some of the organized crime leaders in the area. Eventually, they used him to collect their debts. Finally, he was drawn into dealing drugs. Actually, Cisco had contempt for anything to do with the church. Much of the reason had to do with someone in the neighborhood who had become a pastor. Most Sundays, Cisco went to the house of his friend Tito to hang out and play dominoes. This pastor often showed up there with cocaine, and he tried to seduce the friends of Tito's sisters, who were all of 12, 13, and 14 years old. Cisco knew that this pastor was in his mid-20s and had a wife and kids of his own. How could he live with himself? One day in 1968, when Cisco was 24, he learned that his mother had died. The news hit him so hard that Cisco began crying uncontrollably. When he walked out uh, on the streets to go home, still sobbing, he suddenly saw the 20-something pastor. That this hypocrite should be walking down the street alive when the one person he loved most in the world was gone, tore at Cisco. He suddenly found himself cursing God over and over. Why did you take my mother, he screamed. She used to go to church all the time. She worshipped you and praised her, and you let her die. And this hypocrite pastor who's always trying to molest kids, you gave him a church and he's walking around like everything's okay. After that day, Cisco turned his back on God completely. He even became a hitman, killing for hire. During these years, Cisco also became more and more involved in dealing drugs. At one point, he was the drug lord over a significant neighborhood in Brooklyn. This went on until 1988 when he was arrested and sent to jail for two years. But no sooner was he released than he was arrested again. Eleven days after he had been released, he drove down to the liquor store on Brighton Beach Avenue. As he ex exited the liquor store, he saw two narcotics officers had blocked his car with their own cars. What do you want, he asked them. They told him they were going to search his car. 
Cisco was very careful never to have drugs with him. He might have been one of the biggest drug dealers in Brooklyn, but he wasn't about to get caught with drugs in his car. So the officers didn't find anything. But just then, a police sergeant pulled up in a van. The sergeant asked the officers what they'd found when they told him nothing. He told one, to get, uh, one of them to go to the back of the van, get a kilo bag of coke, put it under his police vest, and search Cisco's car again. This was all said right in front of Cisco. This was the rough justice of that time and place. In the cop's eyes, they knew Cisco was a notorious drug dealer, so framing him to get him off the streets was perfectly acceptable. They took Cisco to a main correctional facility in Brooklyn, which was located in the old Brooklyn Navy Yard. And I'm going to skip over a bunch of stuff. Cisco had been working there, that is in the mess hall, for four to five months when two old friends from his neighborhood walked in. It was Hector, a Puerto Rican whom we'll run into later, and Frankie, an African American. He hadn't seen them in some time and they all greeted one another warmly. No sooner had they done so than the two of them asked if Cisco if he wanted to go up with them to the church services upstairs. Cisco thought they must be kidding. Go where? He said. He made it clear he was not interested. Then the three of them sat down and Cisco told them how he had come to be there, beginning with his own mother's death and his anger at God and the downward spiral into becoming a hardened drug dealer. Over the next weeks, it became abundantly clear that Hector and Frankie had found God in prison. Every chance they got, they asked Cisco if he wanted to join them at the church services, and each time Cisco adamantly refused. Forget about it, he said. This might be for you, but it's not for me. They continued to invite him. One day, Cisco had had enough. He exploded. No, he said emphatically, you ask me every week. Leave me alone. You're driving me crazy. At this point, he went to turn on his Sony Walkman to tune out his annoying friends. But for no particular reason, it wouldn't work. He then asked Hector, could, you, could I use your Walkman? Hector gave his Walkman to Cisco, but for some reason it didn't work either. Cisco would not be deterred. He asked Frankie if his Walkman was working. Frankie said yes, and he'd put fresh batteries that, that morning. So Frankie gave Cisco his Walkman, but when Cisco tried to turn it on, it refused to work as well. Cisco couldn't figure out what was happening. He was frustrated and angry. It was mystifying. At about this time, Hector and Frankie left for the service, leaving Cisco alone on his bunk, surrounded by men listening to their own Walkman or sleeping and snoring. He thought he would turn on the TV, but that wouldn't work either. Now he was furious. What in the world was he supposed to do with no music and no TV and a room full of snoring men? At this point, Cisco thought he might as well go to the service. Anything was better than listening to these snoring men. So he went up to the service and saw that the minister was none other than Dr. Matthews, his bronchial doctor. Like his mother, Cisco suffered from asthma, and Dr. Matthews had been treating him. But here she was playing the role of minister, too. Hector and Frankie were thrilled to see Cisco, that Cisco had come after all. Do you feel it? They asked him. Sister Cisco said he felt absolutely nothing. What was he supposed to feel? Again, the next week they asked him whether he wanted to go with them. He didn't. His Walkman is working now, so he turned it on and lay on his bunk. But five or so minutes after they had gone, Cisco began to feel tremendously agitated. He was normally calm and cool, but for some reason at that moment he felt extremely worked up and out of sorts as though his heart might come out of his mouth. He began pacing up and down the room. For no reason he could make sense of, he felt compelled to go upstairs to the service. Since everyone had already gone up, Cisco went to the bubble to ask for permission. But the CO said it was too late. He said, Cisco would just have to wait until Wednesday. But Cisco couldn't wait, so he asked the CO to call up the captain. Cisco had done a fair amount of dirty work for, the ca for this captain, who was himself connected to the organized crime family Cisco had worked for, including beating some other people up for him. Tell him I want to go to, up to the service and you won't bring me, Cisco said, hoping the captain could get him permission. As it happened, he could. So Cisco went upstairs to the service, but as he looked into the room now, he had a strange feeling. Everyone was singing 
as they had been the previous week. It wasn't his cup of tea, but it had been hard to get up here, so he finally went in and stood at the back since there were no chairs at all there. He was standing about 30 feet from the front when a group was leading worship music from a where a group was leading worship music from a small low platform. That's when he looked up and saw someone on the platform that he recognized. She looked just like his mother. She was part of the worship team. Cisco said to himself, that's my mother. Then he thought, but my mother is dead. At that moment, he started to cry and could not stop. Hector and Frankie came over to him and Hector asked, did God touch you? Are you feeling something? Cisco told him, if you don't want to get smacked in the face, just leave me alone. Those are his ellipses, by the way. The two of them uh, got the message and drifted off. When the worship music was over, there was a call to come forward to pray and receive Jesus. Cisco looked and saw his mother waving for him to come forward to the altar. She was smiling at him with the same smile that he had always loved. He went forward, his eyes still filling with tears. At the altar, Cisco got down on his knees, and Dr. Matthews, who was ministering, came over to everyone gathered and prayed what she called the sinner's prayer. Everyone repeated it, including Cisco. She finished, and everyone stood up. When Cisco got up, he wondered to himself, where's my mother? And he began to look around for her. Just then, an African-American wo woman, seeing Cisco rather obviously looking around, approached him. Are you looking for someone, she asked. Cisco said, yes, there was a woman I saw a few minutes ago who looked like my mother. She was waving for me to come forward from my seat, and she was smiling at me, but I don't see her now. Then the black lady said, that was me waving to you to come forward. It was me who was smiling and waving for you to come down and accept the Lord. Now, Cisco's mother was fair-skinned, but this woman was extremely dark-skinned. So dark that Cisco said her skin seemed to shine. His mother was only five feet tall, and this woman was five foot six or seven. Cisco's mother was a skinny woman, a little over 100 pounds. Well, this woman was rather heavy set, probably weighed more than 150 pounds. He didn't ask. Um, while they both had black hair, this woman's hair was quite kinky. Cisco's mother's hair was straight, and his mother had a gold tooth among her other teeth, but Cisco saw that this woman had no teeth at all. Cisco hardly knew what to think. He said to himself, if that was not my mother, what did I see? At this point, Cisco started to walk away quite confused, but Dr. Matthew saw him and called him back. Here, Francisco, she said, she had obviously been waiting for this moment. She handed him a large brand new Bible. Cisco opened it and looked at it. It's nice, he said, and handed it back to her. But she said, no, it's for you. With this Bible, you're going to start your ministry. Cisco had no idea what she was talking about. What did she mean by your ministry? How would she know whether he would ever have a ministry, whatever that meant? Nonetheless, he took the Bible and left. Cisco still has that Bible, and with the date, with the date it was given to him, written inside it, September 25, 1990. After that day, Cisco went back every time there was a service. What happened to him in that service has changed him forever. It still affects him deeply. And in among uh, various um, omissions, there's a story about how he, in fact, did have a ministry. Then we come to chapter 10, which is healing miracles. I am the Lord that healeth me thee, from Exodus 26:15. Then great multitudes having, uh, came to him, having with them the lame, the blind, mute, maimed, and many others. And they laid them down at Jesus' feet, and he healed them. Matthew 15, 30. When people talk about miracles, they typically think of healing miracles. That's probably because there's something fairly tidy and binary about them. One day the tumor is there, the next it's not. Someone prays for a blind man and he regains his sight. A televangelist prays for a woman struggling on crutches. She tosses the crutches away and leaps about. Whether such miracles happen is a separate question, but when someone mentions the word miracle, most of us think of these sorts of scenarios. In this chapter, I will tell five stories of healing miracles. We're not going to get through all five of them today. Although, as I asked friends whether they had experienced miracles, many more than these five offered stories of miraculous healing. 
they're more common than I ever thought. I remember, I remember my own grandmother telling me how she had prayed for her own leg, which was hurting, and felt a sizzling and was instantly healed. This was in the 1970s. Though I myself have prayed hundreds of times for healing, I cannot recount any answers to these prayers, at least any positive answers. The Bible says clearly that God wants us to ask him to help when we need it, and it is clear that asking for healing when we are sick is part of that. Whether he heals us is another story, but if we don't ask for it, we are preempting the very possibility that it might happen. So we should ask. And uh, the first story is Cisco and Hector, and uh, if you recognize the names, you should. In the previous chapter, I told the story of how Cisco and Galero found God. But that wasn't the end of what happened to him. In fact, while he was in, still in prison, God used him in a dramatic way. Cisco remembered that one day, about six weeks after his dramatic conversion experience, he was walking back to the dorm for, from his job in the officer's cafeteria when he saw that his friend Hector was in bed, shaking and shivering. Hector was wearing his boots and socks, a sweater, his heavy coat, and a thick winter blanket. Cisco asked him what was the matter. I don't know, Hector said. It feels like I'm dying. In Cisco's remembrance, Hector had always been around 215 pounds and very muscular. But the moment Hector and Frankie had arrived, Cisco saw that Hector was noticeably thinner, but he never asked him why. Cisco had always been taught to mind in his, his own business. If someone wanted you to know something, they would tell you. But the truth was that Hector had contracted AIDS. It was perhaps 180 when Cisco first saw him a few months earlier. Now he was even thinner. Cisco had no idea how to respond to what his friend had said, so he just sat on his bunk nearby and opened his Bible. But then Hector called to him, Cisco, come here. What's the matter, Hector, Cisco said, coming over to his bed. What can I do for you? The Holy Spirit has told me that if you pray for me, what I feel now is going to be gone. Cisco had no idea what to make of what Hector had just said. After all, he had been a Christian for only six weeks. If I pray for you, he said, I don't know how to pray. But Cisco loved his friend and wanted to do what he could. One thing he had learned was that prayers were more powerful as the person praying didn't have any unconfessed sin. So he said to God, Lord, if I'm doing something you don't want me to, show me, but I don't want my friend to be like this. After that, right there by his bedside, Cisco began praying for Hector in the only way he knew how. His prayers were simple but deeply heartfelt. Suddenly, Cisco told me a very bright light, as bright as the sun, he said, covered the two of them like a halo. It was a circle. They were on the second floor of the facility, so it couldn't have been actual sunlight. Cisco said that when he finished praying, the light went away, and he went back to his bunk and sat down. Then suddenly he saw Hector stand up, take the blankets off, and take his coat off and the sweater, too. And then Hector began jumping up and down and saying over and over, Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. One of the corrections officers saw what was happening. He knew Hector had been in very bad shape, so he immediately called up Dr. Matthews in the infirmary and told her that Hector had taken everything off and was jumping up and down. A few minutes later, Dr. Matthews showed up and asked Hector what had happened. He told her everything. Then she examined him and said that it didn't seem that anything was wrong with him. For no reason anyone could divine other than the prayer that Cisco had offered, Hector was suddenly feeling fine. What happened that day was clearly mystifying and dramatic, but it didn't halt the overall progress of the disease. Hector continued to lose weight and grow weaker. About two months after the day he prayed for Hector, Cisco had a terrible argument on the phone with his wife, Christine. It so affected him that he stopped reading the Bible and praying. It was a very dark period for him. One day during this time, Cisco walked into the dormitory and saw that they were taking Hector out in a wheelchair. Cisco learned they were taking him to Kings County Hospital where Dr. Matthews was in residence. Hector's weight had by now dropped to about 145 pounds. Dr. Matthews was with Hector and she took Cisco aside and explained there was nothing more they could do for Hector. They were taking him to the hospital to make him more comfortable while the disease took its inevitable course. 
About 10 days later, one of the officers came over to Cisco and told him he had a visitor. Cisco absolutely never had visitors. He had made a point of telling his wife, Christine, never to visit him. So he was sure it wasn't her. His brothers lived in Puerto Rico, so he knew it wasn't either of them. His sister lived in Florida. Cisco had no idea who it could be, but he went to the vis visiting room and saw a woman coming in. She sat down and told him that she was Hector's mother. Cisco asked how Hector was doing, and she said, not well. He was on many medications and had IVs all over him. His weight was down to 120 pounds. But Hector's mother told Cisco that Hector had told her the story of how Cisco had once prayed for him and how his symptoms had vanished instantly. She told Cisco that Hector had said that God had spoken to him again. God had told Hector that if Cisco prayed for him again, he would be healed completely. Not just the symptoms, but the disease itself. Cisco again had no idea what to make of this. How could he pray for Hector? He was in prison. He certainly couldn't go over to Kings County Hospital and pray for his friend in person. The only thing he could think of was to go down to the infirmary and talk to Dr. Matthews. Perhaps she could call Kings County since she was a resident there. Perhaps they could get Hector on the phone and Cisco could pray for him that way. Cisco told Hector's mother he would do whatever he could. So he went downstairs to the infirmary and found Dr. Matthews and explained the situation. He said that he felt he needed to pray for Hector over the phone. Dr. Matthews said she would see what she could do. So she called Kings County immediately and asked to be put in touch with Hector, but that wasn't possible for various reasons. Just then, for the first time in his life, Cisco heard God speak to him, telling him to get the phone number Dr. Matthews had just dialed, so he asked her for it. How do you know it's God? Dr. Matthews explained to him that if they wouldn't let her speak to Hector, they certainly wouldn't let Cisco speak to Hector. But Cisco knew what he had heard. God had told him to get the number, so he persisted. Finally, she relented and gave it to him. Cisco immediately left the infirmary and went upstairs to use the phone. But as he was doing that, God spoke again, telling him not yet to wait. So he obediently went to his bunk and waited. Phone use was restricted and there were no calls allowed after 10 p.m. But it was just after 10 when Cisco heard God speak the third time, saying, Now, go. So Cisco walked over to the bubble and, and knocked on the glass and said to the CO that he had that he had to make a call. I need to make a phone call, he said. I need to call Kings County. But the CO said that wasn't possible. The phone was already shut down for the night, and he wasn't about to lose his job by letting Cisco use it. Cisco said that at this point something just came over me, and I said, if you don't give me the phone, then it's on your head. Cisco later thought that it must have been God speaking through him because he wasn't sure why he said that, but the urgency was powerful. Those words shook up the CO somehow, and he immediately changed his mind and gave Cisco the phone. But he said, please just make it 10 minutes. If you're on longer and they catch you, I'm going to get fired. So Cisco dialed the number. A nurse answered. She asked if he was Hector's relative. Cisco said that he wasn't, that he was a friend. The nurse said that she was sorry, but if he wanted to speak with the patient, he had to be a relative. But he was welcome to come there in person. Cisco explained that he couldn't come there in person because he was calling from prison. The nurse said that that was even worse and he might as well forget about talking to Hector. But for the second time, a tremendous boldness came over Cisco. If you don't put Hector on the telephone, he said to the nurse, God says that he will punish you. Interesting theology there. At this point, Hector, whose bed must have been nearby, said something to the nurse. Finally, the nurse relented. Okay, okay, she said, but you can only talk for a few minutes because I'll get in trouble. She handed Hector the phone. What happened, buddy, Cisco asked. Hector said that the Holy Spirit had spoken to him again. He told me that you were going to pray for me, Hector said, and that he was going to heal me. Cisco knew that what Hector had said the last time had happened just as he said it would happen. There wasn't much time, so right then, Cisco prayed for Hector's healing over the phone. 
After he finished praying, he told Hector that he loved him and hung up. That Friday, the COs told Cisco he had another visitor. He went down to the visitor's area and saw Hector's mother walking in. He braced himself, but when she got to the table, her expression changed. She was beaming. She told Cisco that what had happened, she told Cisco that what happened when he prayed was a miracle. She said that a few minutes after he had finished praying and hung up, Hector's whole body began shaking violently, so much so that all the intravenous needles came out of his body. He then fell off the bed, got up, and started jumping up and down over and over, thanking God. It was a miracle. She told Cisco that the Kings County doctors had been checking Hector for the last three days and they couldn't find any evidence of the AIDS virus in his body. They decided to keep him there for a few more weeks just to make sure that he was okay, but after that they would release him. That was the last Cisco heard of Hector for about five years. And to skip over a few things that has some of which have to do that with that ministry. Um, five years later, Cisco was at DeKalb. That's, of course, my summary. Cisco was at DeKalb Avenue in Brooklyn, meeting with a parole officer. On the way home, he stopped into a restaurant to get a soda. When he bumped into someone who knew his old friend Hector, so he immediately asked a friend about Hector. Had he heard any news of him? The friend told Cisco that Hector was completely healthy. In fact, he was at that time in Bible college training to become a minister. Now, we now come to the healing miracles, and the first one reminds us of Jesus forgiving the sins of the paralytic and healing him. Two weeks ago, Metaxas noted that the Greek Orthodox Church is not always conducive to conversion experiences. Last week, he noted that the Catholic Church has its own disincentives to conversion experiences. This week, a Protestant minister comes under apparently deserved criticism as an obstacle to conversion. I guess um, Metaxas is an equal opportunity offender. Um, it is probably fair to note that conversion does not prove doctrinal, doctrinal orthodoxy, nor do other miracles. Miracles can happen. Miracles are not all from God. But even miracles that are from God do not guarantee correct theology. However, miracles do do one thing that is worthwhile, and that is they point beyond nature. That's a relatively simple conclusion, but in this age, I think that's a profound conclusion. And I think that the data that are being adduced today support that conclusion. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. We have a comment back here. I can always get things started since no one else seems to want to speak. We watched a documentary this week on miracles, particularly at Lourdes. And, and it was an occasion when military people who had been wounded came there for healing. This week's national, this month's National Geographic front page is Mary, and it says she's the most powerful woman in the world, and it deals with miracles that have happened in connection with her. At Lourdes, the Catholic Church has a medical clinic not to treat people, but to examine miracle cures. And they find very few from the thousands and thousands and hundreds of thousands that go there annually, they come up with just a handful of probable miracles. All the rest of those people go away with feelings, either good or bad. I don't think God plays these games. If he does, then we can say we hate him if he treats humans this way. 
I'm leery, and I've had, quote, healings in my ministry, few, some that even were medically documented. But I have become leery of the whole milieu, leery of the whole subject, because I know that in the last days, almost everyone's going to be deceived by miracles. I, um, I can appreciate the uh, comment you just made. Uh, on the other hand, my scientific acumen forces me to believe in miracles. I cannot fathom that life could arise by itself. For one example, I cannot fathom that the forces of physics just happen to have exactly the right force or strengths for their constants uh, by itself. I cannot imagine that the phenomenon of mind that we can think could just arise by random mutations. I mean, uh, uh, miracles do happen. Now, we're faced with the issue of you know, what is a miracle and what isn't. Um, my reaction to uh, these stories is that uh, three, you know, three uh, machines not working, uh, that's, that's possible, you know, you put that down there. I, I don't know how often uh, uh, these machines break down, but uh, if you're really skeptical... It's actually four if you include the TV. Yeah. <laughs> if you're really skeptical, you probably say, well, maybe this was a coincidence, so on. But the, this last story, I, I have a heart. I mean, this person is in a school t taking ministerial after all these coincidences. No, I, 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 I tend to think that one is a miracle. But I respect anyone who's skeptical about these things because there are an awful lot of stories out there. Our mind plays us so many tricks on our body that, uh, you know, we, 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 we can think ourselves into uh, being healthy or being sick very easily. And uh, we need to keep that in mind. The reality is very complex. We need to be skeptical to a certain extent. But we need to recognize that miracles do occur. Yeah. Comment down here. They're very uh, key uh, findings when a person has HIV, and to have all those findings clear from his bloodstream is a miracle. Well, I'm going to argue that it's not quite a total 100% miracle because there are now people who um, are surviving long-term HIV. It's not very common, but it can happen. Uh, so that I'm not sure I can say that the miracle is actually simply surviving HIV. I think that the uh, However, that if you're looking at a course and it's a downhill course and it suddenly reverses, it's a little bit more difficult to explain without some spiritual being inserting himself into the physical arena somehow. Uh, maybe not in quite the same way as, let's say, the Red Sea Party or somebody being raised from the dead. But it certainly does argue that at least in, in this point, you're, you're dealing with something that uh, you could explain it by coincidence if you wanted to. It's an awfully convenient coincidence. When you get too many of these, uh, you have to give up 
the coincidence uh, story. Uh, many of them stand, don't stand up very well by themselves. When you get overwhelmed by too many of these, you have to kind of give in. I agree with that. I mean, I, I think there is something about consistency at a certain point. Yes, and then back. Let me. Yes, you. Then comes the question if miracles happen, why don't they happen when I ask for one? You'll notice that Eric McTaxis has that same problem. Um. Uh, I would I would say uh, I don't want to sound uh, incoherent here. I'm glad that God doesn't answer all my requests. Um, if He did, and I could manipulate everything, I would go insane. And I think if everybody else could do the same thing, the universe would go insane. You have to have consistency in order for reason to work, for logic to work. For uh, If you have too many miracles, uh, you're going to lose uh, rationality. If you've lost rationality, so I'm glad that uh, sometimes our prayers aren't answered. Quite often they are, they are not answered. I mean, it, it's, many of my prayers are not answered. As a matter of fact, one can make a good argument that science grew up in the Western Christendom uh, precisely because uh, there was the concept of a God who is a God of order who did not uh, <clears throat> that, that when you right. have when you have a God of the trees and God of the stones and the God of the forest and the God of whatever and the, yeah. and that they're all kind of chaotically going at each other, there is no reason to expect a unifying law that applies to everything oh, this is a well accepted uh, thesis now that the reason that science developed in the Western world instead of well-established uh, civilization, China, India. civilization, India and China and so on, that had capricious gods uh, that they couldn't predict, is that in the Western world we had not several gods, we had one god, and this one god was a rational god, a god of cause and effect, and you did this, this happened, uh, and uh, he was consistent, and that's why science was able to, to flourish more in, in, in the Western world. And uh, this is not uh, from South School Quarterly, this is from philosophers like Alfred North Whitehead, uh, Hukius and uh, Holland, uh, Jackie here in, uh, I think it's Seton Hall, or uh, uh, these folks have all claimed, hey, the reason science developed in the Western world is because they had a consistent concept of cause and effect. And as a matter of fact, you will find some very popular <clears throat> theses out there that are specifically trying to disprove that hypothesis. That's how strong it is. Uh, Jared Diamond, for example, guns, <clears throat> germs, and steel, I think it is, um, is specifically trying to say that the reason why uh, Western civilization took over the world has nothing to do with a theological concept and has everything to do with our natural advantages. Well, uh, my wife would tell you the story of talking to one of her African students who explained the problem with Africa was spiritualism that they were all steeped in spiritualism. Anyway, I wanted to relate an incident. Be my guest. I worked my way through college, which was difficult. It meant working long hours, but I was just holding on until one month I got a bill from the business office it said that I owed them $25. That was a huge sum of money. 
So I went the next day to plead my case before a business manager with a heart of steel and a face of stone. And I could see I was not getting anywhere. I told him I would work more. I would pay off my bill, not to worry. He turned to his assistant. Well, he didn't turn. He just said to his assistant, bring his file. So the lady brought the file in. He opened it up, looked at it, slammed it shut, and gave it back to her. And he looked at me, and he says, your file is current. And I said, you sent me a bill yesterday. Bring his file. Brought the file back, opened it up, and he said, received of Beth Frederick $25 for the account of Gary Oliver. A woman had sent a check. And furthermore, when I called her to thank her, she said she would send $25 a month for the rest of the year. So it was a great boon to me. And when I asked her why she sent the money, you know what she said? God told me to. Well, I was certainly appreciative. I don't know whether I'd call it a miracle. I think God must have spoken to her. He didn't say anything to me. On the other hand, that kind of communication is arguably a miracle. Certainly in the, in the sense of uh, somehow sort of disproving the idea that there is, or at least at least being evidence against the idea that there is a, um, that our thoughts get no further than our skulls and that everything else is simply the influence of uh, the brain upon the body or, or the body upon the environment. Uh, comment there and then back. I consider that to be a real miracle because she had to write the check, put it in the mail, go through the uh, mail, snail mail delivery process, and uh, a week later it comes to the school just the day that uh, the bill came due. So the, the good Lord looked after him even before the effect. The timing is just yeah. too good. Now well, the very other much like Esther. Nothing in the book of Esther is really miraculous, mm -hmm. um, but the timing is too good. Yeah. Then look at uh, Paul, and he writes in one of his uh, epistles that uh, the good Lord chose to leave a uh, defect in his eyesight, and he wrote how this, uh, this uh, particular letter he was writing in his own hand, and he said, look at what big, huge letters I'm writing so that I can read the, the letters that I'm writing to you. Uh, and uh, so he, he had this defect to his vision, uh, from uh, that uh, event there on the Damascus Road that uh, the good Lord left in place and did not remove from him. So he had, uh, he had prayer, but uh, the good Lord chooses which prayers to answer. Uh, of interest, this is the same Paul of whom they were taking handkerchiefs off of him and sending it to sick people and they were getting healed. So he, it, was, it was literally the physician, heal thyself, he saved others, himself he cannot save. Uh, comment back here, and then I think we have one up front. No, uh, 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 Leonard Brand. Well, when I look back over life, I think there are many times when, when God has guided, but I wouldn't have seen it as a miracle. I, he seems to mostly have clever, discreet ways of, of uh, influencing what happens. And, there, but there are a few that, uh, you know, I couldn't prove anything. I just don't have enough faith to believe it just happened by chance. So uh, I think they do happen. I, I think of one a uh, few years back. I, there was something I needed to do on my house. Some work would be quite a bit of work. And I, it needed to be done. But I would head to the store to get some things. And then I get this strong feeling, don't do it. Nobody said anything, but it, it just was unmistakable. And I, well, this doesn't make sense. You know, how, why? So I'd go back home. Later, I'd try it again, and the same thing would happen. Well, a couple of months later, some things happened that made it very clear why I was not supposed to do that. It would have been, you know, there was some chaos I had to go through that would, would have been a big problem if I'd been involved in this project. So again, I think I, I, I don't have enough faith to think it was just by chance. 
When we were at Auburn Academy, one of the faculty men was out working in his yard one day, and all of a sudden he got this strong feeling that he needed to drive down some little back road. And he finally did, and he got there just after an accident had happened, and the woman had been thrown from her car, and her mouth and her nose were full of mud, and he just happened to be there right at the moment to clear her airways and saved her life. It, it seemed like a miracle to him, but I ag agree with Leonard. I think sometimes God nudges things here and there. Uh, when I was working on my uh, PhD at the University of Wisconsin, we got transferred uh, to California, and um, I ha I'm, was obsessive about reading the manuals about what you do to be sure you do the proper steps. And I got out here and talked to the, the uh, department secretary, and she said, well, what was your minor? Minor? I had never heard of a PhD minor in that particular program. And she said, well, you could have had a distributed minor. Did you take four courses from four different areas outside your major? I had. And you can say, well, that was accidentally, but I, I prefer to look at it as a nudge that God had guided me to do things, preparing me for future work that I didn't even know I needed. Another comment down here, I think. Uh, I sort of prefer the uh, um, term interventions to miracle, and I've certainly had several things in my life that have made a difference. But I think each God works with individuals, and there's no uh, answer to any of them that's uh, you know straightforward for everybody, because He works with us individually. Like with Hector, He was He went into God's service. Um, and it's what we do with these interventions that, that make a difference uh, in answered prayer. Um, and God knows every, uh, every individual and what, he, what he's going to do with the rest of his or her life. Um, and certainly I, I've seen it in, in mine. There's sometimes they're just almost suggestions or sometimes the helping other people when they're in need. Uh, but um, what I, I think that the, there's also the thought of the placebo effect. I think the human mind is very strong, and sometimes like in hypnotism almost, it's so strong that it can uh, make something happen that wouldn't otherwise. So uh, there is that, uh, mm -hmm. that part of it too, I think. So each, each answered prayer or even... Um, things that the devil might do, they, they all have a different reason and answer. So miracles might ultimately be, or at least many of them might ultimately be explicable in terms of natural law, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Comment? Or am I missing somebody over here? <coughs> uh, there, there's one I'll mention. When I was one year old, through some circumstances, I became very sick just overnight. And uh, we lived a long ways from the nearest doctor, and my dad said, we don't have the money to go to a doctor. So that was that. Um, the middle of the morning, my 12-year-old sister was out on the field. We lived on our farm. She was in the middle of a field. There was nobody around. She heard a voice say, take Leonard to the doctor. So she ran back and told my dad, and he took me to the doctor. And, you know, I won't go into details, but I'm alive today because of that. So I have no doubt that something happened. Um, I, there's an illustration I've used sometimes that I, th I think explains um, a lot of things that, that we might call supernatural. If you, um, we, we're in this room and there's a solid ceiling above us and studying the physics of the ceiling we can say well there's, there's no way we're going to get wet no matter how much it's raining. Uh, but I can take a bucket of water and dump it on your head and you'll get very wet. That's not a miracle, but I change the, the course of events. So I think a lot of times, you know, God has laws that he, that he runs the universe with that allow him to, to handle any situation. And he just has to change the course of events to, for something to happen. Yeah, it's entirely possible that we may find out eventually that 
all miracles follow a law, in which case they're all, in one sense of the word, scientific. The law, though, one, one thing I'm quite sure of is that the law is not that the, the nicer person you are, the more miracles you get. In fact, it almost looks like it's the reverse, that people who are starting out to become Christians seem to get more miracles to begin with than those who are more experienced. Can I throw a kink in the works? <laughs> Pardon me? May I throw a kink in the works? Sure. Um, Ellen White one time was asked to pray for a man to, that he would be healed. And the Lord told her not to pray for him because if he was healed, he would go back and continue to do some of the evil things that he'd been doing. Positive answer to prayer. Well, the, to meta prayer. Yeah. But that's in a sense a miracle too. That's a divine intervention. Because God knows. And the thing is, if 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 you acknowledge or admit God into your life every day, there's a miracle that happens every day and people come by that you just needed or you know, you get a letter you just needed or uh, something happens, the sun rises and it's beautiful. I, I, this business of putting miracles way up there somewhere, there are so many little miracles that happen, have happened to me that, that are just little, but they're very significant. I had a prayer, um, uh, a, a healing when I was seven years old because I prayed. And um, that thing that I prayed about never ever returned. That was a miracle because God loved me and he did that for me. And I think he does a lot of things for us. And if we didn't have such a highfalutin idea about miracles, maybe we would appreciate them a little bit more. Well, I'll just tell you a little something about my own experience. Is that one of the things that I have found is reproducible is I'm, I'm good at losing things. Uh, I'm actually better than I'm most, I think. And um, I have found that after I've searched everywhere I know to find it, it works reproducibly to say, God, I don't, I've lost this and I need it. Can you please help me find it? And 10 seconds later, occasionally while I'm actually getting off of my knees, um, uh, I'll find the item in question. Um, it's not 100%. But, you know, it's kind of like you said, is after a while, it starts hard. It, it takes a lot of faith to believe that this is just coincidence. Um, recently, I was reading some things in the Bible and then in Ellen White that um, I think address what Mrs. Roth was talking about. Uh, it, <clears throat> God said to, to Adam and Eve after they'd sinned, said, I will put enmity between you and the devil. Okay, why did he have to put enmity there? Because it wasn't there before. Yeah, and I think it goes beyond that too. It, I mean, he'd already he just told them what the problem is. So why wouldn't that be enough? Well, he had to somehow put enmity there. And I think uh, from reading other things, the reason is that the devil is simply too clever for us. There's no way we could um, keep we we could avoid his tricks and, and his, his influence if we were on our own. Um, it, it is indeed, we, we talk about the miracle of conversion. What is it a miracle? Because we simply could not uh, outthink the devil. There's no possibility we could, we could do that. It's worse than that. Yeah. We kind of like it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and so the, the, 
Uh, you know, we're told that there's a that grace is that there's an influence of grace around us as real as the air we breathe, and I think this is what it's talking about. The, there's the, the God's influence, the devil's influence are very real, and unless we accept that enmity that God puts there, there there's no we don't have a chance. There's no way we could uh, come through in, in a positive way. Well, I, I suppose I could uh, complicate the picture a little bit by uh, uh, thinking, this is my way of thinking on this, now, and so just accept this as a private view. Uh, sometimes God has to remind us that uh, there is cause and effect. Um, when a hundred million, a hundred thousand people are killed in an earthquake, um, you ask the question, where was God? Why weren't some miracles performed there? Weren't some of those people worthy of, of life? I have life, why, why didn't they have a chance at life? Uh, type of thing. But I think that there's a deep lesson there that we, we need to learn. Uh, there is cause and effect. Getting back to what I've been saying before, there is cause and effect, and we, sometimes we need to be reminded of this. Mm -hmm. That uh, you know, some people have the idea. Well, uh, everything's going to be great. Everybody's going to be saved. Uh, I think that tendency has to be countered by some rather hard facts. If you bang your head against the wall, it's going to hurt. And you're less likely to do it again. Yeah. Uh, we need to learn lessons, there, and we need to learn that. Evil is there, and uh, that uh, it's something we need to avoid. Uh, these are all, I mean, mm -hmm. I'm repeating myself. Reality is rational, the universe is rational, and uh, we needn't give up on reasoning. Uh, but we should be very grateful for miracles occasionally that occur. Uh, and we should uh, do all we can to help as many people uh, be saved uh, and help God save as many people as he's trying to save and so on. I just, so we need to keep that whole broad picture in mind. The thing is more complex than we think. And uh, God nudges at times, I think. God performs more striking miracles at times. And a lot of people at times interpret things that they think are miracles that are not. It's just so on. It's a complex picture. Reality is we, simplistic thinking is not fruitful. Reality is more complex. Comment here and then there. I often hear people say, well, when something happens, well, everything happens for a reason. And um, I think that's totally different from what you're talking about. But every little thing that's happened, well, that was that happened for a reason. They don't know why it happened. They didn't have any rational thought, but it happened for a reason. That's one point. The other one is, in the tragedy that happened in our neighborhood recently, 14 people died, but an awful lot of people did not die. If I were one of those who did not die, I would probably agree with them, oh, I'm so glad that my angel protected me. What about the angels for all those other people? What about the ones that weren't saved? Was God not watching over them? I think we get a little bit too simplistic in, in wanting to find an answer, so we come up with something that's non-rational. Why would God save me, but he wouldn't save the person next beside me? Or maybe he didn't have anything to do with it. Maybe there's something else completely going on there. Maybe we just live in a world of sin. Bad things happen to good people. Good people die in car accidents. Good people die of cancer. Oh, well, it's interesting that Sister White uh, makes a suggestion that this uh, planet is a demonstration to the universe and it's demonstrating the effects of sin 
gone wild, what Satan's plan would have resulted for the entire universe if Satan had been allowed to be a controller of the universe. And so that some of the things that, bad things that happen to good people, as well as bad things happening to bad people, are a result of this demonstration. Yes, how long, O oh Lord? I agree. Well, just taking a whole different corner on this uh, problem, I've mentioned to some of my friends, what if David had walked up to Goliath and handed him a couple of psalms instead of bringing a slingshot with him that day? He probably would have never heard of David. He was the line of Mes in the line of the Messiah and probably wouldn't even heard of children of Israel. To complicate the picture and to try and help us avoid from getting too simplistic and to draw too simple answers, uh, we need to keep in mind the devil can perform miracles. Uh, and he's going to perform miracles that will, if possible, deceive the very elect. And this adds to this whole picture. There is, there is, there are good miracles and there are bad miracles. And uh, it's all part of the picture uh, that we have. And uh, let's not be too simplistic. Okay, we have a few more weeks on miracles, but I'm going to pass the, uh, or have the mic pass back to uh, Leonard Brand here, and we'll give him the last word. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know about you know, how important it is to have the last word, but anyhow, um, I think sometimes one aspect of, of not being too simplistic, we may confound bad things happening with questions of salvation. Just for an example. Do we know that all the people who died in Noah's flood are not going to be saved? Could there have been some young person who wanted desperately to come to the ark, but their parents prevented them, would not allow them to come? Um, some of the cultures around Israel were, were, were killed off. They're told to be killed off. Do we know that all those people are lost? Um, you know, maybe a culture had to go, but there could maybe there was an individual God will say later, well, you know, I understand that was difficult for you, but, but you know, it, this all had to happen, but I'm, thank you, but I'm glad you're here in heaven. How long we live here, it really isn't that important. And so we probably can't always explain all these things that happen and know whether evil things happening are related to whether the person was good or not. Well, I would agree with that, and on that note, I will, uh, we'll continue this conversation next week with some more... Uh, uh, data as examples. <laughs>